rear mirror. So if you wish to go forward, you need to look back in order to look forward. Let's look at Nigeria's production statistics. We were 2 million barrels per day, to, you know, by the 1970s. Precisely, our production went from 5,000 uh, uh, barrels uh, per day in 1958, when we started the first exportation, to 2.3 million barrels in 1974. That was a rapid progression. But since then, all we hear, we seem to have frozen, we seem to have um, choked. And we're talking about 2 million, 1.9, 2.1, but we're still dancing around the same, you know, target that we achieved way back in 1974. It's, it boggles the mind. And even at that time, in 1974, we had projected at the rate we were going, 4 million barrels of uh, crude oil per day, and more than 40 billion barrels of uh, reserves by 2010. What happened? We failed to walk the talk. That's why we're not there yet. Now, let's take a look at our, you know, uh, our reserves at 37 billion. It might look impressive, but when you look at other countries, that you're chasing after, you know, the Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait. It is worrying that we seemed again frozen, we seem to have choked, and we seem satisfied at 37 billion barrels. That's a whole lot of oil, but not enough to play that strategic role of uh, a hub. Now, let's look at some of the statistics. We were at 25 barrels by 2004. We were at 35 one year after. That's a whopping 10 billion barrels added, you know, in one year, 2005. We were at 36 by 2007. 37, which we are, you know, brandishing now by 2010. Since then, nothing. Okay, except the money, very recently. Even OPEC, of which we're a member, became perplexed that Nigeria was not moving. You know, what I love about our fellow Nigerians, particularly the younger generation, is that when they meet, you know, they ask you how far. Even OPEC had to come in to say how far, you know. In their 2012 report, it noted, OPEC noted, that Nigeria's reserves had been stagnant, while Libya, which was in tumor, you know, had recorded additional fines to make it the leading uh, country in terms of reserves in Africa. Now, why numbers matter? Why do numbers matter in this business? Because the oil and gas business is a long-term business. You project. They're already selling. <laughs> this is September. They, they, they're concluding contracts for December, January, you know. So it's a long-haul thing. For supply contracts, the customers would want to know that you have spare capacity in case of unplanned uptick in their needs. Example that, you know, occasioned by a bad winter or natural disaster that you can ramp up your production per day and meet their needs. Now, in terms of reserves, why do we bother about numbers? Because customers prefer engagements for the long haul. It's like, you know, you're dealing with suppliers of things you sell. Uh, tint tomatoes, you know, margarine, anything. You want to know that your supplier has enough stocks in some warehouse. You need to inspect this warehouse before you give him a contract, even in the short term. Even for the reasons of self-preservation, recently 
when Saudi Arabia was awash with oil and with all the um, restrictions of uh, OPEC imposed by the OPEC agreement, um, they, they, they had to sell some oil at very discounted prices to the US. The September supplies to the US were terribly knocked down prices. But you have to have the capacity first before you can play that kind of poker in the open uh, oil market. So there are good reasons why matter, uh, why the numbers matter in this business. But is it doable to chuck up your uh, numbers in a rapid fashion? The answer is yes. I've just shown you the case of Nigeria. Let's take the other case of Libya, which is in pole position um, in regard to reserves in Africa. In 2006, Libya was at 39 billion barrels. In 2007, watch the years, the numbers, they were at 41 billion barrels. In 2009, 43 barrels, a billion barrels. At um, 2010, 44 billion barrels. By 2012, 48.5 million. So in six short years, they had added 10 billion barrels. Now, six short years, 2006 to 2012. Nigeria in the last 10 years, zero to our reserves. With all the potential that we have. In contrast, Algeria, you know, is 12.2 billion barrels. Angola, you know, down south, which are pretenders to the throne, uh, have 9.1 billion barrels. So even back then, while OPEC was inquiring about uh, stagnant reserves, Nutu Sumono, the CEO country head of Shell, had complained that the development of the petroleum industry did not match the ambitions of the country to move to 4 million barrels per day production and to grow its oil reserves to more than uh, uh, 40 billion uh, barrels. And then to do more with his gas in order to raise additional income, we translate into revenues. He complained also that Shell, at that time, Shell alone, was losing 16 million uh, uh, barrels of um, uh, uh, per day. Not, not, not 60 million uh, million barrels of oil to oil theft. So it was a very worrying situation. And that happened because of the seeming chaos within the industry. Now, where there is a will, there is a way. And while OPEC was inquiring, Venezuela jumped from 211.2 billion uh, barrels of reserves in 2010 to 297.7 billion barrels in 2012. In two short years, they went from 211 to 297. Therefore, uh, leaping over Saudi Arabia, which had held that pole position, which had, uh, which is uh, 265.9 billion barrels. So these things are doable. In less than a decade, for instance, the USA grew its production to 12 million barrels per day. This is by last year, 2019, to become the number one producer globally. Less than a decade ago, the US was dancing at around uh, four, you know, four million barrels, five, they were yo-yoing. Yes, this is due mostly to 
the uh, shell gas revolution, uh, particularly from the Permian Basin, close to um, the borders of Texas and New Mexico. But again, it shows that these objectives are doable. The, the, you can meet them if the will is there. Now, another story that is, you know, uplifting is that after President Obama lifted the ban on energy exports from the USA in 2000, I mean, in um, 2015, Kenya Energy built a 12 billion gas uh, exportation terminal in the Sabina Pass between uh, Texas and Louisiana. Um, today, Kenya Energy exports uh, liquefied natural gas to more than 30 countries in Asia, Europe, and South America. You're talking five short years. So these ambitions are doable. You, you, you can meet these targets if the will is there. And if you do enough to support uh, the talk. Now, let's look at the way we are before we now know where we're going. Nigeria, uh, according to uh, the last um, uh, petroleum uh, minister, Minister of State for Petroleum, Ibe Kachuku, the projections from studies is that um, at full blast, Nigeria would need 1.3 million barrels of crude per day to meet its refining needs. Today, theoretically, we're at 45, even though, I mean, 450 uh, uh, thousand barrels per day, at least that's what is claimed, but really nothing is happening. Now, when you are producing about 2 million and you need internal, for internal purposes, 1.3, what is left for export? Come on, do the arithmetic, and you find that very little is left. It means that you're going to default even on the existing contracts, not to talk about, you know, new contracts. Now, how about the other uses? Till date, we're importing refined um, petroleum products. You know, even though in expanding the, um, the terrain for local producers, there was a model followed by workers made uh, by um, Seplat uh, and the rest to have production refining capacities in the same location. Now, how about the need for petrochemicals? Everything you see around you or you use from the lowly toothbrush to the bullet train, to your cars, to the Airbus 380, to the Dreamliner, back to the lowly lipstick that women use, contains one form or the other of petroleum. How about the methanol plants? So what do you do? Look at products from a barrel of crude. And it's, it's, it's really, you know, amazing how much you can get, you know, in terms of uh, products from refining, creating effective refining uh, 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 capacity. You have your diesel, you have other distillers, you have your jet fuel, then you have other products, which, in other words, your petrochemicals and things. Then you have heavy fuel oil, then you have liquefied petroleum gases, the LPG, then you have the gasoline. Now, how about our gas? In the introduction, somebody talked about 200 plus trillion scoff. Nigeria is essentially a gas province, they say, with some bit of oil. As, as, as dominant as our oil uh, seems to have been over the years, Nigeria is actually a gas province. That means we have immense potentials in this regard. Our needs locally is uh, about 5 billion scoff per day. What we're only doing at the moment, 1.3 uh, billion scoff 
one, you ask yourself. And this is a country that flares gas, you know, a lot of it, amounting to about $1.234 billion annually. This is a country that cannot find enough gas to power its, um, its, uh, its plants, electricity plants. Now, this is a country that requires gas as feedstock and still we're flaring. We don't have enough. We point, I think in August, we, we, we imported 70%. These are official statistics of our LPG needs for domestic use. Then there is also LPG for, for fuel and other uses. So we don't seem to be doing well there. The reality is that our needs as a country, our needs for petroleum resources are mountain because there's a whole a vast array of manufacturing industries that are dependent on petroleum. I venture to say that our unmet needs for petrochemicals threaten a prosperous future for our country. Now, sometimes we have a way of putting the cart before the horse. And I've heard a lot of people talk about the need for energy efficiency. Yes, energy efficiency is critical. And we do teach energy efficiency as being central to energy economics. Um, but energy efficiency is about consumption. The savings you're able to make, the conservation you, you, you're, you're able to bring to bear on your consumption. But fundamentally, if you are energy poor, efficiency can only take you that far. You need resources. So for us, we need petroleum resources. And this realization has led to the you know, uh, a revised concept of energy uh, efficiency, where we now consider in energy economics, um, uh, we consider energy economic uh, efficiency under an expanded concept of energy sufficiency. Now, another way to describe sufficiency is enoughness. That's an economic term. The, Enoughness, do you have enough? Critical question. And this has implications for energy security. If you don't have enough, you can't be secure. Which then underpins all the elements of sustainable development and by implication prosperity. So it means that as a country, we need more resources, both oil, and gas to become that energy hub, which is the theme of this uh, Independence Day celebration lecture. Or certainly. So the good news, the good news is that Nigeria is awash with oil and gas. And this is not conjecture. You need only to look at my um, lecture to the uh, then fledgling association of the Nigerian Association of um, Petroleum Explorationists, NAPE, 1987, in the ballroom of the Eco Holiday uh, Lagos, when I painted a picture of the basins, the inland basins, the offshore as sources to be explored and exploited. That lecture was titled Source Rocks and Sorcerers. Now, in the light of what we know now about the availability of oil in those basins, those who are present, they are still calling it the sorcerer. Then of course, there's the issue of strategy. Today, in this country, when the Niger Delta sneezes, we catch not just a cold, because a cold comes and goes, but we catch pneumonia, which is potentially lethal. So it is imperative as a country to diversify 
our sources of oil and gas. It's not just an issue of militancy or insurrection or that. It's just a strategic uh, uh, notion that you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Now, I talked about the sources. These are the petroliferous basins in Nigeria. And you can ask those in the know. And I'm sure listening in somewhere is Pastor Dan Ndefo, who used to be exploration manager for ELF, now Total. He's in retirement now, that's why he's a pastor. Um, but he knows a few things in terms of finding oil and expanded uh, uh, ELF territory in terms of um, uh, finding new oil and gas for the company. You need to ask uh, another classmate of mine, um, Professor Meke Kwaza, who is one of the best, foremost petroleum geochemists who deals with petroleum systems. You need to ask uh, Lambate Kiambare, my buddy. You need to ask Fatona. Oh, I'm even going too far. Ask Mosto, Professor Mosto Onoa, the president of the Academy of Science, who is a geologist. He knows this stuff. That, look at the offshore. Look at the inshore. Very few countries on our continent are this endowed. You have the Anambra Basin, the Benue Trough, you have the Bida Basin, you have the Lumedu Basin up there in Sokoto, you have the Gongola Trough where the Kumani uh, River find came from recently. Then of course you have the Chad Bronu Basin. All these are prospects for, huge prospects for oil and gas from what we know. Like I said, this is not conjecture. There's been a lot of preliminary uh, uh, studies to indicate these finds. Of course, the offshore, and if you're in doubt, look at Bunga, Shell's Bunga, and the prolific nature. So you have all these uh, uh, reservoirs brimming with oil and gas, waiting to be exploited. Now, the good news is that Kilmani gave us fresh hopes for these uh, inland basins, never mind the offshore basins. Because on October uh, 10, 2019, oil was discovered. In fact, oil and gas discovered in Kilmani, in Kilman River, uh, in the Gongola Basin, you know, and projections are that by the time we're done with that basin, we would have added one billion uh, barrels to our reserves. My feeling was that of euphoria, or in fact, eureka, because it was like, I told you so. Now you see. Then fear descended when I heard the next thing. Um, thank you, Prof. Prof, you have uh, five minutes to com conclude. The next thing I heard was that NNPC wants to do it itself. And the NNPC uh, says it will deploy wall cast um, cotton age technologies, you know, for the exploration, for the exploration of this basin. And will then undergo oil and, you know, gas exploration to include the Benue Trough, the Chad Basin, Sokoto, and Bida Basins. Now, if you see the number of O's in the no, this is a hard way to travel. If it persists, Nigeria will not get to the hub, not even in 50 years, not even beyond. It is like choosing to ride on a donkey rather than a horse when you are in a hurry. Or going into a race car competition with a Volkswagen instead of a Ferrari. And there is more to it. The problem is, the problem with Nigeria is not in what we have done or what we do, as much as how we have done them. At every fork in the road, we seem to have taken either the wrong turn or a less optimal path. Now, you need to call your grandmas. Don't call DPR, don't call them um, the presidency, don't call the police. Grandmas have a way of getting messages across and tell their grandmas they are taking the wrong turn again. DEY will not do it. And you might tell me, show me the money. 
And my answer is you don't need any money, at least not your own money. The choice of appropriate fiscal system guarantees that investors will pour in. It's about risks, rewards, and incentives. If you pump up the gravy, you will see the place awash with investors. Why are fiscal terms important? Because if managed successfully, petroleum and mining projects can generate large revenue streams for the state. The right set of fiscal terms will enable the government to strike a balance between attracting the best investors and getting a deal for the country. Now, this is the fiscal system. You have contracts, you have concessions. Concessions were the old things that are of date now, since independence of most of the um, developing countries as they became independent. And we now focused on production sharing agreements. And there are many variations depending on the specificities of the country. There's the Indonesian model, the Peruvian model, the Egyptian model, the ba even the, and if you go to the other side, the service contracts. You have the Iranian buyback. All of them have their peculiarities and their advantages. Now, look at the risk and reward of main contract points. In the concession, you have all risk, all reward. For government, reward is a function of um, royalties, uh, bonuses, etc. For the production sharing agreement, the exploration risk lies with the foreign oil company, which then shares in the reward. The government shares in the reward alone, does not put money up front. If you look at the joint venture, uh, you share in the risk as a country and you share in the reward. And you look at the pure service agreement, which is just a contract, do this for me. There's no risk for the foreign uh, contractors. You share in the risk as a government and reward. Now, the PSA, the, the production sharing agreement has it. The FOCs take all the initial risks. Only once oil is produced can costs be recovered. The state, on the other hand, has no direct financial risk in the exploration phase. However, it has to monitor that, you know, it has to monitor what's going on, the work obligations, the number of wells to be drilled, that technology. Now, it makes sense for any national oil company like the NNPC, I mean, it does not make sense for any national oil company like the NNPC to scramble to get in there early, throwing in scarce resources. The fact that PSAs are the dominant exploration and development agreements worldwide points towards their efficacy as efficiency as an institutional arrangement for risk sharing. It's a win-win situation. Now, who lost it? Why did we make the wrong choice in going, you know, in veering away from PSA at the onset? Was it a case of inattention or lack of negotiation skills or other dis the distracting circumstances? Now, spare thought for NNPC and DPR, because by the time they were established in 1977 as the successor to NNOC, uh, which was established in 1971, they inherited a fiscal system that was to prove a burden. That burden was the joint venture agreements with FOCs. It was certainly the wrong term. Now, look at that choice of JVC, which has left us with at least six handicaps, a contradiction where the NOC is both operator and regulator. And that left us with a poor regulatory regime for the industry. It left us with a crippling uh, cash call system, you know, where we are doling out uh, five uh, billion US dollars per year for something that is ours, for something you didn't need to get involved in in the first place. Now, it left us with a higher per unit uh, production cost in terms of a barrel. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, they produce oil at 10.7 barrels of oil. Um, uh, Iraq is doing about um, uh, 10. 
Same thing. Here, we have an average of 21 to 30. It left us with a perpetual environmental crisis because DPR was not tight enough. Oh, sorry, Prof. Uh, uh, I, I, sorry, sorry, moderator. I thought I had 45 minutes. I have a clock in my front here. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, please, let's keep to the agreement because uh, I, I have put in time to prepare this lecture. Okay, okay, bro. Yes, I, have a, I have a clock in my front, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, bro. Okay, so um, it left us also with um, uh, host community alienation and much of the crisis we have uh, is due to that alienation. It left us with obsolete technology uh, and then lack of effective monitoring of our production. So the thing is to go for the PSA for future exploration and production. It will liberate us from the cash calls. It will let investors roam the known hydrocarbon basins of the land. It will let the landscape be dotted with drilling rigs. I repeat, it's all about risks, incentives, and rewards. If you pump up the gravy, the investors will come running. Now, government's business, as we know, is generally nobody's business. The foreign oil companies have by far comparative advantage in terms of the ownership of frontier technologies, both for exploration and production. The fact is the functioning of the international oil business can be quite intricate. The webs and entanglements in terms of ownership and participation of subsidiaries in oil field operations, in transportation, in storage, refinery, they boggle the mind and you can't get to the depth of it. So you leave them to do the initial efforts. You know, even in terms of participation, most PSAs give the NOC a chance to participate. And you can only come in after the oil has been found. But most countries are not interested, including Nigeria, you know. So it is not as if Nigeria did not try to deal with the contradictions, distortions, dysfunctions, etc., that weighed down the development of the oil and gas industry and deprived the nation of the goodies that were due to us. It was like trying to get out of quicksand. The harder we struggled, the deeper we seemed to sink. Everybody knew where the problem lay. It was structural, uh, the, but the government and the people were talking over each other. Now, here oil and gas, this is an independent assessment. He says, the inability to progress the joint venture agreements to more nationalistic and entrepreneurial arrangements uh, is the result of the economic rent-seeking mentality of the Nigerian operators of the oil and gas business. Now, the joint venture agreements give the National Oil Company, the NNPC, the possibility of taking over after 20 years. That has not happened, even though it has the, its own um, upstream exploration company, the NPDC. Now, if I was judging, I would have been more charitable because I know more things. This is coming from the International uh, Joint Oil and Gas 360. Now, was it a case of paradise lost? I would say almost, but definitely it was a case of arrested development. We lost foreign uh, direct investment for development of oil and gas industry. We lost a chance to boost our reserves and production levels. We lost opportunities to lock in oil and gas supply contracts and by implication lost income and revenues, we lost industrialization and the employment and jobs that go with that. We lost money, uh, we paid for petroleum products. I'm sure subsidies will be ringing in your ears. We lost building infrastructure, pipelines, flow stations, transportation hubs, etc. We lost energy power, you know, security. We lost chance to build critical mass of skills, high tech power. We lost the study services sector development. We lost the first steps we'll have taken to engender a low carbon economy. The little urchin on the streets of worry in Delta State was everything spoiled just because we didn't get a handle. Now the Petroleum Act 
people looked to the Petroleum Act of uh, 1969, but there were no redeeming elements in it. Come to think of it, there were not supposed to be. It had been cobbled together in the midst of, you know, uh, uh, the Civil War to repeal a mishmash of pre-existing and confusing uh, ordinances and acts. Viewed at that time, the um, Petroleum Act of 1969 seemed to be exceptionally concise. But, well, in a way, with hindsight, it had to be because the actual objective of the military government was to take control of not only the oil and gas industry, total control, but the entire workings of the Nigerian state. So, and worse still, and please listen to this one, that particular act vested on the Minister of Petroleum uh, the ownership and control of oil and gas on behalf of the people of Nigeria. I put that deliberately in red. This singular provision drove the country further into a deep uh, morass. The unsettling reverberations are still very much with us. Painful, emasculating, regrettable. Now, the civil rule set in 1999, and again, the center of attention was the uh, uncommon phenomenon of the regulatory the, the National Oil Company, the NNPC, being both the regulatory and uh, having regulatory and participatory roles. So the agitations for reform of the sector had been predicated on clarifying their formation and the greeting. Now, after reverting to civil rule in 1999, the difficulties persisted and further stalled efforts to revamp the oil and gas sector in Nigeria. Now, the year 2000, Within and outside the petroleum industry, everybody recognized that our main economic lifeline was not properly oriented. Something had to give. It needed, the car needed not just wheel balancing and wheel alignment, but an engine overhaul. What year could have been more auspicious, if not the monumental year of 2000? And writers and commentators everywhere we are calling you know for government to do something remember this was the year targeted for food for all education for all shelter for all so it was an appropriate year to do something enter obj 2000 president of Asanjo said enough of the mess and set up the oil and gas sector reform implementation committee on April 24, 2000. Now, the national oil and gas policy that emerged focused on the imperative to isolate commercial establishments in the oil and gas in Nigeria from the administrative and policy institutions. Regrettably, Obasanjo's dispensation did not totally implement the prescribed OGIC policy recommendations. Now, enter Yaragua. 2007, and Mr. Moderator, I'm getting to the end of my presentation. Um, on September 7, 2007, President Umaru Yawadwa designated Dr. Rewanu Lukman to head a reconstituted uh, OGIC with the technical backstopping of Dr. Emmanuel Eboga, special advisor to the president on petroleum, and ordered it to narrow down the elaborate recommendations in the NOGP. National Oil and Gas Policy into comprehensive institutional structures that are lawful and pragmatic in regulating of the oil and gas uh, segment in Nigeria. That was their terms of reference. Now, the committee headed by Lukman presented this report on August 3, 2008. The report gave a pragmatic regulatory structure of, uh, of institutional restructuring that could transform Nigeria's oil and gas industry into worldwide prominence. The report featured operational methodologies to, for driving the national oil company to a worldwide status and proposed answers for monetary approaches to the lingering issues influencing sectors 
of the oil business in Nigeria. Now, a key recommendation of the OGIC was the separation of the commercial institutions from the regulatory boards. This was in an attempt to make the national oil company, the NNPC, more profit oriented. Remember Aramco, which is a government owned company by Saudi Arabia, but is the most profitable company in the world. Never mind what Bezos and Amazon say, you know, that they have, you know, surpassed them. Now, the eagle has landed. The new regulatory framework put forward by the Rowani Lukman report would ensure accountability and transparency when implemented. So what lay ahead was the need for the petroleum industry to enhance and consolidate to an even greater extent sectoral indigenous participation. And that saw the rise of the independence, you know, the Seplats, the Walter Smiths, the Sun Trust, and, and the rest. Now, one becomes four. The package of reforms in that OGIC was presented to the seventh uh, assembly as the petroleum industry bill. Now, one would have thought that the passage would have been a slam dunk, but no, the seventh assembly played touch football and passed it to the eighth assembly, who then said, no, this is unwieldy, break it up. It was broken up into four. Now, despite initial assurances for speedy uh, passage, the eighth assembly continued the touch football uh, started by the seventh and only got it to the present president in the lame duck uh, period. Yes, this is a bill that encapsulates redeeming policies and strategies for steering the uh, petroleum industry uh, uh, as an engine for sustainable development and prosperity. Somebody will say, cry the beloved country. First on the table, of course, is the PIGC. And being industry professionals, I will not go into that. Now, the PIB has been resubmitted in 2020 as an executive bill. But we're hearing the same familiar voices from the same dramatic personnel. We're hearing discordant messages from the presidency and the legislature. There's evidence of crossed line with some interference by the oil producers, trade sector, select. There's even some bit of guerrilla warfare going on there. So will it fly? That's my question in trying to end this presentation. I go back to the beginning of this lecture and the, what the French say, ça dépend. That means it depends. But failure is not an option. There is nothing like a perfect bill. So we need to run with what we have. And so I'm telling the Society of Petroleum Engineers who gave me the honor of the podium for today's uh, celebration that they should go tell the story of the PIB on the mountains. Now that the Society of Petroleum Engineers has set its eyes on behalf of the nation, so that the ones strategically located to play that role on getting the, the country to play the role of hub for Africa and beyond, it is time for SPE to stand up and to be counted. You've been too quiet for too long, now it's time to let your trumpets be heard from the top of the hills that envelop Abuja. Let the sound be piercing. Yes, piercing. Let that sound be unrelated. Let it be compelling because the stakes are that hard. And most times you hear people say that the beautiful ones are not yet born. When I gave the library lecture last year, I told you don't listen to that that the beautiful ones are born. Some of our finest as a nation are amongst your ranks in the SPE. We talk about the indomitable Joseph Ajenka, the irrepressible Wumi Ladere, the irreducible Awalu Sarki, uh, the unflappable Aristotle John Emezi, the inimitable Hajia Damadami, uh, the Abulian Garba, uh, Ali Garba Ali, and etc. All of you are the beautiful ones. And because you're beautiful and you're capable, I would echo the 
a session of Hagia Amina, which I gave to you at the beginning. Yes, we can. Nigeria will become that energy hub. It will be long before that 50 year time frame. But that time starts now. In that March, you will repair the land to produce a long awaited prosperity for present and future generations. If you get it right, we will be joining them. Them is in quotes, and you know, on the other side of the divide, and we should be singing money, 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 money in a rich man's world. So with this, I salute the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and in particular, the Abuja section, on the occasion of the country's independence diamond jubilee. But don't forget, I told you that everything you see or touch, ranging from the lowly toothbrush to the Airbus 380, to the uh, bullet train, to your cars, to again, the lowly lipstick has some petroleum in it. So when anybody says to you, diamonds are forever, don't be afraid. Say back to them, so is petroleum. At least I'm entitled to my opinion. And with that, I say doma regato, which is Japanese for thank you very much. I appreciate the honor of speaking with you today. Thank you, thank you, Professor Chidi Ibe, FAS, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I took a lot of things from this presentation. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough. A lot of brilliant ideas you have shared. Um, I love some of the things you say. For example, Nigeria has a poor position, which I think is very true. You talked about um, if you do not scope the future, you, you, you get stuck in the past. You talk about uh, nature has blessed Nigeria with enormous resources and also placed us in a strategic position uh, to, of course, to, uh, to be a giant uh, of Africa and indeed a giant in terms of energy as well. And you, you indeed uh, uh, spoke uh, deeply regarding uh, some of the things, some of the fears that people have, have had about oil, uh, oil disappearing uh, very soon, and you calm us down and you, you told us not to worry. Uh, everything that has, everything that we see around has oil in it. Um, I, I truly like your presentation uh, for the fact, in fact, what I always, um, my thinking is that we have oil, uh, we, should, we should use our oil now, we should, we should make sure that we maximize the use of our oil at this, at this point. And you stated that clearly uh, where you post a question and ask, why keep the petroleum in the ground? Uh, you also say that uh, sometimes people speak, uh, speak about energy sufficiency. Uh, I mean, energy, uh, um, you, you, you prefer to talk about energy sufficiency than uh, talking about uh, um, energy efficiency. Then you, you also say that we should look back to look forward. Um, and then you gave clear examples that uh, in the 70s, Nigeria attained about 20, uh, sorry, 2 million barrel per day production. Uh, today, we are still struggling. Our budget is sitting around 2.1. We are struggling to get to 2 million many years after. You talk about um, the reserves. We are, we, are, we, we are yet to grow our reserve even up to the 40 million that we have been aspiring for a long time. And you gave a clear example with Venezuela that uh, of grow reserve within, I think, two years. Uh, they grow nearly at six and, uh, billion barrel in reserve. And then you talk about production. You mentioned the US, US uh, increased production. I think within a uh, few years, they increased their production to up to 12 uh, million barrel a day. And I think my summary about your presentation, you try to say that we should maximize the, 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 the oil and gas that God has given us. Uh, we should plan for the future. Uh, you talk about policy, you talk about uh, the oil law, the petroleum industry deal. 
and you, I mean, on and on and on, you, the, the presentation was very insightful, very, very insight, insight, uh, uh, informative. Um, uh, Prof, thank you so much once again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, um, I want to uh, encourage all of you to keep your questions, just keep sending your, your questions uh, for Professor Chidi Ibe. Uh, we are going to take the questions uh, towards the end of the uh, webinar. Um, before we move to uh, our next speaker, uh, I want to create your indulgence to recognize uh, some of the dignities we have uh, missed. Of course, uh, we, uh, I want to inform you we have the Director of Petroleum Resources, uh, who is also the CEO of Petroleum, uh, the Department of Petroleum Resources, and the person of uh, Engineer uh, Awal Serki. Uh, we, we are really pleased to have him today for, um, to talk to us. Um, I want to also recognize the presence of Abba uh, Abdul Misu, who is a senior uh, SP member in Abuja here, uh, also the former uh, Deputy Director of DPR, uh, we want to also uh, recognize the presence of uh, Abubakar Buba, who is a Zona Operations Controller DPR in Abuja. Um, we also have uh, in, the, in the webinar, Mr. Paul Osu, who is the head of Public, Public Affairs Unit of DPR. Uh, we have our own Professor Kalani Bello. Uh, also in the call, we have uh, Professor Lawrence uh, Ezemoye. And all the way from Nye University, uh, head of department, Dr. Uh, head of department, department of Petroleum and Gas Engineering, Dr. Petros Nzerem, uh, welcome sir. We have engineer Michael uh, Onyere with us. We have engineer Otman Mohammed. Um, thank you so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. If we have not recognized you, uh, it's just because of the time schedule. Uh, we thank you so much. Um, we are now moving straight uh, to the next phase of the uh, webinar. Um, the next uh, uh, speaker um, is the director and the CEO of the Department of Petroleum Resources, DPR. Um, so uh, I will be going through his uh, profile. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I crave your indulgence to uh, admit me to read the profile of engineer Awaru Sarki. Engineer Awaru Sarki, the director, uh, the, the, the director and CEO Department of Petroleum Resources. Um, who also doubled as the chairman PTI governing council was born in 1965. He had a good record of sterling academic accomplishments before he joined the DPR. He was at the Amadou Bello University, Zaria, from where he backed a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering in 1989. Thereafter, he proceeded to the uh, Bayero University, Kano BUK, where he earned a postgraduate diploma in management in 1993. Uh, done with BUK, but he certainly he was not done with uh, acquiring knowledge. Uh, Engineer Walu moved to Chevron Academy, where he uh, was awarded a certificate in oil and gas handling facilities, maintenance, and troubleshooting in 1999. Awalu's education uh, was not restricted to uh, in Nigeria. Uh, he was also at Petrat, Norway, where he got a diploma in drilling risk assessment in 2000. Two years later, he got another diploma in petroleum policy and management from the same institution. In 2006, Awalu obtained a diploma in offshore technology from Petroski USA. And in 20, uh, 2007, he returned to the Petrat, Norway, and earned yet another diploma in petroleum policy and operations in, in uh, 2017. Um, the, the DPR boss was, the national, was, was at the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies Guru in Joss. Uh, obviously, uh, these academic acquirements did a yeoman's job in preparing a world for an industry where he has since been a major player. He started his working life at the Federal 
uh, Housing Authority FA, FHA in Lagos as a youth, as a National Youth Service Call uh, member, serving, serving as process engineer in charge of sewage and water treatment plant between 1989 and 1990. From 1990 to 1992, Awalu was with Kano State Ministry of uh, Industry and Commerce where he was able to develop industry inspection module for Kano State. He also successfully initiated the uh, concept of small scale technology in business incubation. He successfully reviewed several industry proposals and oversaw their implementation. implementation. Some of such industry concerns were Kumos Sheet Gas Glass Company, Intravenous Fluid Production Company, Surgical Gloves, Syringes and Needle Production Company, and the Fertilizer Blending Plant. At the Kano State Environmental Planning and Project, uh, Pro uh, Protection Agency, where he worked as environmental engineer and project manager at various times between 1992 and 1998, the DPR boss was instrumental to the construction of the Central Industry Effluent Treatment, Effluent Treatment Plant at Chalawa, Sharada, and Bompai Industrial Estate. Kano River Pollution Project and Waste Earth Dam Pollution Control Project, among other projects. Um, since his movement to the DPR, Awalu has held some key positions in the organization. At various times in his 21 year stint at the DPR, engineer Awalu served as assistant chief chemical engineer, chief chemical engineer, deputy manager, manager, safety control manager, uh, upstream facilities. As a principal chemical engineer between 1998 and 2000, Engineer Awalu successfully supervised several collaborative projects of the DPR with oil giants such as Chevron and Shell, among others. Having started out in the agency in 1998, Engineer Awalu rose through the ranks to the position of assistant director before his elevation as the director of the organization. As the director of the DPR, Awalu is no doubt a round peg in a round hole. And not too many people are surprised that he hit the ground running immediately after his appointment. No wonder. President Muhammad Buhari held him as a driving force of the agency in the statement announcing his, uh, him as the director of DPR. He is a register, he's, he's a register, uh, he's registered with, um, he's a registered engineer with Council for Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria, Koren. The DPR Hensman is a member of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, member of Society of Petroleum Engineers, and an associate member, Institute of Chemical Engineers, United Kingdom. Just days after he was announced the DPR director, the agency under his leadership unveiled a set of new guidelines of operation for the upstream sector of the Nigeria oil and gas industry. The regulatory document is part of efforts geared towards limiting the cost of oil and gas production in the country by 5%, as demanded by the federal government, and to make companies focus on exploration. Uh, of course, what uh, 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 Chidi mentioned several, several. Uh, some of the new guidelines, guidelines are work program and budget automation, rig and vessel work automation, drilling completion, re-entry work process automation, and the Nigerian Oil and Gas Contract Advertisement Portal, NOGCAP. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me at this juncture to invite our very own engineer, Awalu Sarki, to proceed with his presentation, which he titled Leveraging Nigeria's Abundant Fossil Fuel Resources in the World Undergoing Energy Transition. Engineer, I want to say the virtual stage is yours, sir. You are welcome. Sir, you may want to unmute yourself, sir.
Gina Sarki, we, we can hear you, sir. You are talking, but unfortunately, we can't hear you, sir. Maybe you may want to increase your volume on the device. Hello. Yes, you can hear your voice now, sir. You may also want to put on your video, uh, your camera, so that I will see you, sir. <laughs> yeah, you are still mute. Can you unmute yourself, sir? Oh. I'm, I'm on, I'm on. Uh -huh. Hello? Yes, hello. You can, you can you, uh, okay, can, can you see my video now? Yes, sir. Can you see me? Yes, sir. Very good. So, the, the, uh, are you seeing my slides? Yes, I can see your slides, sir. Very good. So, our uh, first, thank you so much for this opportunity for the department to be part of this history. SPE is always uh, in the lead. I wish to appreciate the society that we treasure very well. And uh, members are always active. And I would like to, before I commence my presentation, I would like to commend the professor of a very uh, well done job and uh, I elaborated the paper. Even though I have some. Is the first, the first act in the Petroleum Act the resource is vested on the state, not on the minister. So that I think is very, very key uh, because everything we do is based on what is the issue between NNPC, NNPC and uh, DPR. So the regulator and the operator is in not in any way uh, having core job. Opportunity for NNPC 
but every other person interested in oil and gas business in Nigeria. And uh, five, uh, five areas which I will dwell on, uh, which uh, is the energy and uh, I will now go on Nigerian oil and gas uh, uh, resource also on the, the Nigerian potential for Africa energy security. Then I would like to, to tell us to to so now Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, why uh, the director is trying to sort out the technical issue uh, on his device? Could you please uh, click on the link in the chat box uh, to, to sign in the attendance uh, so that you'll be counted as one of those that are attended? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Director. I, Lance, I understand that my voice was breaking. Um, please, if you can hear me, can you please go to the chat and click on the link uh, where you can um, fill, the, fill the form so that you'll be counted among those that have attended this uh, event. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm very pleased on this particular uh, opportunity to be able to participate in this uh, excellent initiative celebrating our days in the Thank 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, why we we allow time for uh, the director of DPR to, to sort out um, the technical challenge um, to save time? Uh, may I read the profile of the next presenter, uh, Professor uh, Mostos Onoha? Uh, 